You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Today we are in Praia Mare. Praia Mare which is on Tuesday. That could be a tough one. There's a climb near the end there. I would, I would look out there for Diego Lisi. We heard there at the opening from our absent friend, Daniel Freib, uh, who, as soon as Diego Lisi won today's stage four of the Giro d'Italia, was texting us, insisting that we open the episode with a clip of him presciently tipping Lisi for today's stage. Have you got, you've got the text there, Lionel? I haven't, but he sent it to us saying, um, can you make me look really clever and important? He's a bit left out, isn't uh, he? Well, you know, he's, he's got a lovely week at home before coming back out, hasn't he? So uh, good that he's still part of it, though. You know, it's, it's lovely, and, we'll, and he'll be part of it later on when we hear the shark's tale, which is really getting interesting. I think today's shark's tale is the most poignant yet, certainly the longest. And it's going to move people, I think, as it has been doing already. Let's not over-promise, eh, Rich? OK. Anyway, uh, Dove Siamo, Lionel. Where are we? Well, we are in Praia, Praia al Mare, which is on the coast, on the kind of the, 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 just at the bottom of the shin of Italy, I think. So we're on, as you look at the map, the left-hand side, little coastal town. I've only caught a very brief glimpse of the sea so far, but what I am surprised about is how hilly it is immediately inland here, and they obviously could have made today's stage a lot tougher than it was, and it was tough enough as it was. So shall I just give a little rundown? Give us a summary of the stage, and then we'll introduce a special guest. Our tale of the tapa. Stage four from Catanzaro to Praia Amare, 200 kilometres, hugging the coast nearly all the way with a few small hills and one steep one about eight kilometres from the finish. It was like a mini Milan San Remo, really. Um, we saw Damiano Cunego, the 2004 Giro champion, on the attack. As it all boiled down to the finale, two AG2R riders, Guillaume Bonifant and Hubert Dupont, broke clear. They were joined by a larger group and it all came back together. Then Diego Ulisi of Lampre attacked on the very steep climb and he held off the chasers to win the stage by five seconds from two Dutchmen, Tom de Moulin and Stephen Kruiswick. It was Ulisi's fifth Giro stage win in his career. De Moulin's back in pink as Marcel Kittel lost eight minutes. As for the overall, Andre Amador lost more than 30 seconds to all the other GC riders, so the movie star rider slips down the GC. Igor Anton and rider Hazidal, the 2012 champion, were also in that group. Carlos Betancourt was even further back, losing just over a minute to De Moulin. So De Moulin in pink, Cunigo takes the blue jersey from Martin Chilingi as King of the Mountains, and Kittel is still in red, and that is the day on the Giro. Yeah, it was quite an action-packed stage, wasn't it? I was going to introduce our special guest, but he's on hes on the phone. Uh, oh, no, he's off the phone. I hope I didn't, I hope you didn't end that prematurely. It's Giro Scogno Emilio. Hello, listeners. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for another invitation. And Richard, when you call me, I always answer, as you can easily see. Well, yeah, it was very important that we have you on today, Chiro, because today was known by the, the Giro as the Chiro stage. Today was a stage dedicated to Chiro for his long service uh, or something. But it was all beaches and sea today, wasn't it, Chiro? Yes, uh, Richard, yes. But the real question is... Why in this Giro there is only one Giro stage? Don't get greedy now. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's really difficult to answer. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know how can I answer, so it's difficult for me. His phone's just ringing and he's taking his phone call. I mean, we should, we should point out Giro's day job is as the, one of the lead writers on Gazzetta della Sport, the newspaper that effectively created and invented the Giro d'Italia. Uh, he's gone running off across the road to talk to a colleague, I think, so we'll get Chiro back in in a minute. It's a shame because he knows the stage winner, Diego Ulissi, very well, we'll Lamprey rider. We'll get him back. A, a kind of trademark move from Ulissi, wasn't it? He made his move on that final climb, and that's his fifth Giro stage win of his career. I think he won his first one in 2011, a couple in 2014, and one last year. Of course, in the middle of that somewhere, I think in 2014, he had a nine-month ban before exceeding the limit of salbutamol and asthma medicine he was taking. That's the limit of my Diego Ulissi knowledge. Well, we know that that's the sort of stage that's made for him. He's very good. He's a sort of Philip Gilbert-type rider, isn't he? A puncher. 
So it was very easy to predict that he was uh, a strong contender <laughs> for today's. If you're stage. listening, Daniel. Uh, very, very simple to predict. No, we'll get we'll get Chiro uh, back. But as you mentioned, Lionel, um, we landed in southern Italy last night. We said in the episode a couple of days ago, I think that we're not. You, you and I have not really been in this part of the world. I've been Sicily. Uh, haven't been south of Rome, and the landscape really took me by surprise. I think I was expecting flat, arid landscape it's very hilly very lush uh, almost tropical all these conical hills it could have been a really mountainous stage today they did the riders a bit of a favor taking them up the coast the, the roads were certainly not easy at all but they, it could have been harder i mean you know there's a lot of viaducts and things leveling the, the main road but you know these the climbs around here are absolutely vicious so it could have been a, a real killer but you know first day back um uh, the day after a rest day still very early in the race I, you know, I think they wanted it to be hard and, and you know produce some aggressive racing, and it certainly did that, but not not too hard. Um, and we did see a it was a terrific day's racing. I thought. Well, I, I caught up just at the finish with Ian Boswell, the team Skyrider, who rode very well, finishing in the front group, and he was pretty happy just about what it was like being in Italy. Here's what Ian Boswell had to say. Ian, fourth day of the Giro, but first day in Italy. Does it feel any different being in Italy? Yeah, I mean, especially just the the difference in the roads today. I know a different a different passion for the race. You know, I think it was a, quite a spectacle to start in the Netherlands, and the fans were fantastic. You know, it was huge crowds. But to be here in Italy, it's also a, what a Tuesday, so maybe less spectators than we would see if it was a, a weekend. But no, it's beautiful. I mean, today was an awesome day. I mean, that stretch on the coast was felt like I was in tour of California again, just cruising down, looking over at the at the sea. It was looked like quite a tough stage, though. There was a bit of a selection. You were in one of the front groups there. Was it quite tough out there? Yeah, it was. And I think, uh, you know, it was hard in the beginning with uh, Nipo missed the break and then tried to send a rider across, never made it. Um, so it was a fast start. I think we did the first 80K in an hour and a half, which was nice to get that done. Um, and then wasn't really too much stress until maybe the last 40K. But we had Lopez was up off the front for a bit, Sebastian, and then uh, with Nico, Landa, myself, and Dagnum were in that front group heading into the base of the final climb, and Phil and I both got tailed off at the top of the, the last climb, so not in the front group, but, you know, Landa was well looked after, and I think it, you know, because Stellan saying to Kaylee, you know, we didn't have the numbers in the front group, but I think we had a lot of riders up there with, you know, contention to, to be there, and I think especially once we hit the higher mountains, we'll, we'll be ready. A lot of our listeners enjoyed our friends, especially young Americans with yourself, Larry and, and Joe Dombrowski. Have you seen much of them the first few days? Yeah, Joe, talking about flicking, pulled out a line the other day and I gave him some grief over that. But uh, no, other than that, no, I've yeah. talked talk with Larry a fair bit and no, I keep up with those guys. We actually have our own little WhatsApp group of the Americans and I think Chad Hogg is in it as well and uh, uh, Joey Roscoff, kind of the the forgotten child but uh no we have a a good group of americans here and catch up all the time after races and whatnot eurosport the home of cycling eurosport are sponsoring us at the giro d'italia along with science and sport uh eurosport sponsoring the peddler de charme daily peddler de charme award which hasn't really kicked off yet it will do i presented a jersey today to a writer that was nominated by a listener if you tweet tweet in your nominations hashtag pdc giro and we will present the T-shirts to writers. There's, a, there's been a few nominations, a few popular writers already. So please keep them coming in. We've been rejoined by Chiro. Chiro, we're in southern Italy. This is your neck of the woods. Tell us about the area. What do you know about this part of the world? Uh, well, uh, I can um, reveal a secret to all our listeners. For a lot of years, when I was a child, because also I was a child, I can imagine that it's difficult, news. it's difficult to understand, but it was like that. And I had my holidays in this area. Uh, well, not especially in Praia Mare the finish line of today but I was in Maratea a lovely city not very far from here so if our listeners want to go it's a good bet we'll not spoil too much about the southern part of Italy because we've got a kilometre zero coming up on Wednesday morning which Daniel has been putting together talking about the contrast between the north of Italy and the south of Italy quite a lot of controversy over the years that the south is neglected a little bit a little bit by the Giro d'Italia I have to say looking at the route the way we're carving our way up the middle of the country um, in the next few days it, it does look like the organizers want to get away from the south of Italy as quickly as possible and into the rather more sort of lucrative surroundings of Tuscany and further north 
Yes, yes, it's true. I think uh, it's something that, in my opinion, is linked uh, maybe sometimes with the economic situation of Italy, because, you know, normally organizers try uh, to go where they could also uh, receive money for their presence in there. I mean, it's not a secret and I think that it's normal. But uh, as a matter of fact, also, I mean, there were a lot, a lot of people here. And so also, in my opinion, Giro has to reflect about this aspect in a certain way because passion re here is really high. The passion was high. I mean, Catanzaro this morning, the crowds were enormous. I think we were ex Holland was such a success and, and such a festival atmosphere there. I think we were expecting it a bit like when the Tour de France went from Yorkshire to France. It, it, you know, it seemed like the, uh, the pressure went off a bit and uh, the crowds were thinner. Here in Catanzaro this morning, Tremendous crowds, great excitement. I mean, we heard from Tom Dumula, who's back in the pink jersey, that the experience of being in pink uh, in Italy already, he feels, is very different to being in pink in Holland. He says the experience here is one of being pushed around. <laughs> if you're in the pink jersey, you get pushed around. Can you tell us, Chiro, because you probably have to rush off and, and work again, but tell us a bit about Diego Lucy, who you know well. It's a nice story. Well, there are a lot of nice stories about Diego Lissi. His, um, his father, Mauro, there is a specific reason because uh, Diego is named Diego. Because uh, his father, Mauro, was a, a huge fan of Diego Armando Maradona. And Armando is the, na the real name of Diego Lissi, is Diego Armando Lissi. Diego for Maradona, Armando for the grandfather of Ulisse, his name is Armando, but for coincidence is also Diego Armando Maradona. <laughs> I know that Diego Armando Maradona, <laughs> listeners, for an English, uh, for English um, listeners, is maybe it's not a name easy to, to listen, but for Very me, popular in Scotland. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah he's, the, he's the man who punched the ball into the net in the 1986 World Cup quarterfinal between England and Argentina. Very famous footballer, played for Napoli of course your team yeah yeah exactly he played from Naples for Napoli from uh, 1984 to 91 anyway uh, tell us about Elise not Maradona yeah 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 exactly there must be more to Elise yeah, than the fact uh, he's named after Diego Maradona and uh, it's some, something strange because uh, you know Diego is, an, is a fan from U, of Juventus not about Naples and his wife is a huge fan of Fiorentina and so a lot of quarrels in family in Italy we we already we have considered uh, uh, going back uh, let, let's try also from time to time to speak about cycling the early stand why not you're, you're listening to the football podcast with uh, <laughs> Richard Moore Lionel Bernie and Chiris oh, Emilio. but not joking uh, Diego uh, Ulissi has always been considered in Italy a kind of uh, successor of Paolo Bettini you know certainly for the moment he has not the palmares of Paolo Bettini especially in the classics maybe he hasn't been very consistent for the moment but he has already won five stages in the Giro he won two times the words when he was a junior 2006 and 2007 and who knows that maybe in the next years he could become also a classic hunter he mentioned uh, Micheli Bartoli as well in the press conference yes Is that because a writer he looks up to exactly because uh, he's, he's a trainer uh, Bartoli is the trainer of Diego Lisi it's already but a similar a similar kind of writer as well in a way uh, Yes, well, Bartoli won also a Tour of Flanders. I don't think that, for example, Ulissi is for Tour of Flanders. Certainly, it's for the second part of Classic of Ardennes. You already arrived sometimes in the top 10, not more for the moment. Before you go back to ask uh, to write your articles for the newspaper, Giro, one last question. How important is it that the Giro d'Italia lands in Italy and the, on the first day we have an Italian stage winner? Does that give the race a big, a big lift in the uh, minds of the public? Yes, because uh, when the Giro starts from abroad, it's always huge, but Italians, I mean, for the Italians, the real start of the Giro is in Italy. And the fact that uh, an Italian won the first stage in Italy is important. And now we have to wait, hopefully, for uh, a, an Italian pink jersey, because imagine that uh, uh, Lionel and Richard, also you should know this, that in the last two editions, I mean, 2014, 2015, uh, 42 stages, so 21 and 21, only one day an Italian got the pink jersey, Fabio Aru last year. So we have to wait, let's hope and see. Excellent, Chiro. Chiro's running off there. That's the sort of context that we're it looking for like from the, him. The perfect moment there to, for the shark's tail, Lionel. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. 
in Olanda voli parlare a basso da uomo a uomo. Quel che succederà in corsa non deve cambiare le cose fra noi, gli dissi. Non ti preoccupare, squalo, mi rassicurò. In Holland, I wanted to speak to Basso face to face. Whatever happens in the race mustn't change anything between us, I said to him. Don't worry, shark, he reassured me. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport. You can buy Science and Sport products at www.scienceandsport.com and they are very kindly offering 20% off, 20% off if you enter the code SIS20. We, um, we could have done with some gels and bars the other night, couldn't we, when we missed dinner at oh, the Amsterdam Airport Yotel. We could. Um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a foodless night, unfortunately. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was the only real... Disappointment. We also have to thank Maserati because on when we arrived in Southern Italy, we took delivery of a gleaming black Maserati, huge Maserati that had been driven down from England just for us. And we're extremely grateful to them. A few people, we posted a few sort of cryptic partial photographs of the car. A few people, quite a few people guessed which kind of car it was. And uh, some imagined that we'd spent our friends' money on this. That's not actually if, the if case. If only. If we've, only. <laughs> we've, we've been loaned it for three weeks. Maserati are great supporters of cycling. They're sponsoring quite a few cycling events. We'll tell you a bit about their involvement in cycling uh, later on. But thanks very much to them for the beautiful car, which is very, very big. And we imagine very fast. Both of us are very cautious drivers, Lionel, so I'm not sure we will <laughs> test its limits. Mm. But mm. Uh, we're led to believe that it's a very quick car. So thank you very much. Mentioned Friends Money there. You can become a friend of the podcast at www.thecyclingpodcast.com. Mentioned it as well in my little chat with Ian Boswell uh, earlier on. He featured with Joe Dombrowski and Larry Warbass in a, an episode called The Young Americans. Uh, and that was a day with them in Nice. So sign up there, £10, and you will get 11 special podcasts, including maybe... A couple of extra specials during this Giro. Ah, we might we might details. sneak a few, just uh, reward our friends for their support this year, and uh, put a few things available only to people who've signed up as friends of the podcast, just to to sort of over deliver and and thank them for their commitment to us. Yeah. While I'm while I'm sort of plugging stuff and doing things like this, um, I've just got a text message from our our, our um, head of winning behaviours, Jonathan Rowe, reminding me to ask you dear listeners to leave a review on iTunes if, if you if you are inclined to do so that would be helpful um, thank you very much and thanks very much for all your feedback so far on our Giro podcast we have to talk about Tom de Moulin yeah. back in the pink jersey back to the race yeah Tom de Moulin yeah I, well we, we sat in the press conference didn't we Rich and uh, well you asked the question because I think you'd spoken to Mark Reef, the sports director of Giant Alpecin and, and it was a surprise to me but I suppose on reflection shouldn't have been but de Moulin was actually gunning for the stage win. I mean, knowing that Kittel would probably get dropped on the climbs, the pink jersey, barring disaster, was going to rest on de Moulin's shoulders again. But they really fancied themselves for the stage win as well. Well, let's hear from Mark Reef, the sports director. Sorry, coach at Giant Alperson. Here's Mark Reef. Mission accomplished today then, Tom de Moulin back in the pink jersey. Yeah, you can, uh, you can say that. Of course, uh, the first goal was to, uh, to win the stage. But, uh, yeah, at least he was too strong. I mean, that's interesting. So, because de Moulin obviously attacked late. Did you look at this as a stage that he might be able to win as well? Yeah, yeah. We look at up front like that. And then, of course, when everything went how we wanted to go, then uh, then also the pink jersey in the end would be, uh, would be possible again. I mean, the second place and the pink jersey is not a bad uh, result for today. That's a, a measure of your ambitions, not just the pink jersey. You're kind of... There's a tinge of disappointment that he didn't get the stage. He's obviously in terrific form. Yeah, I didn't see how he was in on the climb, but uh, yeah, they passed with 25 riders, so it's difficult to say how he is. Of course, he's good, otherwise he would not uh, be there. But yeah, we, we spoke also about uh, yesterday about uh, the opportunity uh, to uh, to do something in the in the last kilometers. It's really good that he uh, that he could that he still had the legs to uh, to do it. We've spoken a lot about Giant Alperson uh, so far this year having real struggles obviously after after the terrible crash just the last few days have you seen how a performance like de Moulin's on Saturday having the pink jersey in the team have you seen how that infects the rest of the riders with a sort of co- a, a confidence that you maybe haven't seen this season it started already the, the switch was really in Roubaix uh, and then we got a really I think a good um, Arden classic uh, campaign we had a really good race in uh, Romandie where he uh, got fifth 
and I think that gave already a huge uh, boost to uh, to the team. And uh, if you look to the prologue, uh, what you uh, said this morning already, yeah, we were with uh, with four guys in the first uh, 13. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah, that that is all. That means already that we uh, are with the whole group uh, back on track. And um, yeah, Tom is exceptional. Thomas said, Thomas said that you know he's here for the mainly for the time trials and, and Rio is his main goal. But have you would you rule out the possibility of a performance like we saw in the Vuelta last year? No, because he also did not prepare uh, really uh, for that. We really we really focus on uh, Romandie for the to go for the GC and also for the time trials here and to, to look also to the possibilities in the stages. But uh, we also did not prepare really for the for for a GC here, so that's not uh, something what uh, what is in our minds. I think the the last week, the third week, is really really heavy, and um, yeah, normally the GC contenders will grow into the race, and normally will, with Tom it will uh, it will go down, normally his shape. The other thing Tom de Moulin said in his press conference was he was obviously asked how he feels compared to the Vuelta a España last year, which he came very close just a few days from winning. It was his first big breakthrough as a Grand Tour rider. And he said he'd been quoted before the race as saying that he'd been preparing for the time trials here. There's a time trial in uh, Chianti Shear at the weekend, um, around all the vineyards, I'm imagining, I'm hoping anyway. So his focus and his preparation has been on the time trials. The obvious question with him being in the overall lead again and with uh, an easiest day tomorrow and then an uphill finish on Thursday is how long can he keep the pink jersey and he's he's talking about uh, defending it uh, as long as possible remaining in contention overall for the first week and a half and then seeing where his legs take him and he did say that he doesn't feel as well prepared for the high mountains as perhaps he was at the Vuelta because he hasn't done any training um, at altitude in the run-up to this Giro but he did say that his power is up and he feels more explosive but that he's a little bit heavier than last late last summer so I mean, it's always a it's always a bit of a game of poker work talking yeah. to a rider about his form, but he he looks confident. And Mark Reef as well, you know, didn't rule it out the possibility that what he did at the Vuelta last year he re, he repeats here. And I think Dumoulin's not ruling out either. I spoke to Dumoulin this morning at, at the team bus. It was interesting. Their bus was parked furthest away, and there were a lot of Italian uh, fans or a lot of people in in the town and nobody at all around the giant Alpeson bus which was a stark contrast to the last few days in Holland and he came out of the bus and I was the only person standing there so I went and spoke to him for a few minutes and he was quite pleasantly surprised that won't be the case tomorrow he will be he'll be mobbed tomorrow being back in pink speaking to him also this morning he wasn't ruling out he did point out that you know he went to the Vuelta not expecting to challenge for the overall last year and ended up doing so and came within came very close to winning the race so I think he's keeping an open mind, um, but he's realistic enough to know that the final week is extremely hard. And, you know, he's making big efforts as well. He made a big effort today to try and win the stage going clear in the in the closing couple of kilometres. Too late to catch Ulisse. But, you know, if you're, if you're going for the, the stage like that, then you're using energy that is going to cost you eventually. Uh, I always remember lots of people t- tell you that riding a Grand Tour is like starting... Uh, a journey with a full tank of petrol and it's really how you use that petrol over the course of the three weeks and these sudden accelerations erratic riding will will eventually catch up with you well that that definitely is true because the last 50 kilometers today were pretty chaotic and and de Moulin made the case that although giant alpecin had riders at the front it was very difficult to control lots of jumping around lots of battling for position um and it is days like this that, that begin to to uh, sort of take a toll on the riders I mean when you look at the overall I mentioned in the, the little roundup at the start that Andre Amador had dropped down uh, lost a bit of time over half a minute so he fell away from the top three overall the time bonuses are, are, are causing a little bit of a, a jiggle at the top of the order as well and really as it's as it's looking at the moment that another rider from the Netherlands who will be very happy with how today has gone will be Stephen Kruiswick of Lotto Jumbo, who has leapt up to fourth overall. And I say leapt up, he's moved up a few places to fourth overall. And just behind that, really, there was t- starting to be a little bit of a shake-up when you look at Vincenzo Nibali's just behind him, Alejandro Valverde is also in the top ten, Esteban Chavez, Ilnur Zakarin, Rigoberto Uran, Rafael Maika, all those riders stacked up, and then Mikel Lander, as again, you know, we talked about the prologue and the, the time that he lost in that, but he's right back on the shoulder of everybody he's, uh, uh, right, yeah. that he needs to be on the shoulder of. And, you know, uh, it was interesting. There was a, a slight note of dissent in the press conference when 
Dumoulin was talking about the Mark Reef's plan. He wanted them to, as he said, cause some chaos today, and he wasn't in favour of that plan. I think it sounded to me as though they started the day, I think, with four in the top ten overall. They've now only got two in the top ten, so a couple fell away. But he maybe Mark Reef was maybe thinking that somebody else could get the pink jersey. You know that that Dumoulin might be marked out of it, somebody else. And it sounded to me, and I'm guessing here, but it sounded to me like Dumoulin was keen for it to be all about him because he probably feels that he's got the best legs and, and, and so it proved. Well, we'll see on Thursday whether it's going to be all about him because uh, the summit finish there, the first one, it's only a sort of, it's a prima piatti, I would say, of a summit finish at Rocco Rosso. Um, but it, that will be the next big shake-up, and then that will root out a few more of uh, a few more of those who are feeling weak at the moment, and send us into the weekend's time trial. By which time we'll have a be- pretty clear picture of who the contenders in this Giro are going to be. The, ri- the other rider, the other giant Alpecin rider, still in the top ten. In fifth is George Priedler from uh, Austria. Now he'd be a good winner of the Pedler de Charme, Priedler de Charme. Very good, Richard. Could, we I mean, could just. A- Modify a T-shirt a little bit, maybe. <laughs> Pridler de Charme. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Should we wrap it up? I, I meant to come back after Daniel's shark sale because, you know, I did say at the start that it was a particularly poignant edition. And, you know, that this, this, this memory that Vincenzo Nibali had of his conversation chat with Ivan Basso at the Giro back in 2010 when Basso reassured him, don't worry, shark, he said. It's lovely, lovely little, lovely little moment captured there in Vincenzo Nibali's autobiography, which Daniel's reading a line from each day. I like to think that uh, the riders refer to the, each other only by their nicknames in in Italian cycling. That's that's the image I have. Well, we saw the little prince on the attack today, didn't we? <laughs> Damiano <laughs> Cunego rolling back the years. Famously, um, uh, when Lance Armstrong rode the Giro in his comeback year, two thousand and nine. He got very angry with Kunigo during one stage and went, Hey, little prince. <laughs> and did actually refer to him by his nickname. Hey, little prince, what the bleep do you think you're up to? Something like that. that well, he's, he's in the King me. of the Mountain jersey, so he will have to count that as a, that's a good day out. A good day out for the little prince, yeah. Mm. Something we neglected to mention the other day was Jean-Christophe Perrault. You mentioned there were two mm. AG2R riders on the attack today, but we for, forgot to mention it in our episode, but a very sad end to Perrault's... Giro, the oldest ever debutant, and you know you don't imagine he's got too many Grand Tours left in his legs, and he, no. he had a terrible crash, and I think he he considered himself quite lucky. Um, mm. He was taken off to hospital, had a brain scan, he's okay, but badly knocked up, and obviously out of the race, didn't make it to Italy. And would have been a sort of outside contender for a kind of place in the second half of the top ten, I would have thought. I mean, unlikely to ride the Tour de France this year, although maybe that will change, and maybe he'll be in a support role for... Um, Roman Bardet the OG2R team leader <laughs> Roman, Roman Bardet, Bardet whose, whose name whose you were name. searching for there. I was scrolling through I, I was getting through A and I was, I was moving <laughs> on to B <laughs> right I think that, 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 of course I think <laughs> Daniel often gets Warren Bargill and Roman Bardet mixed up he did I think he did an interview with Warren Bargill at a race last year and, and called him Roman Roman throughout <laughs> so, so it's easily done and they're yeah. both B so it's they very are. confusing they both are. bar bar Indeed. Well, let's let's call it a night there, shall we, Rich, and find our hotel, which I think is here in Praia Amare. Tomorrow we're heading off in a northerly direction, as we will we're, be for the rest of the week. We're north, as north as quickly as possible, aren't mm. we, really? That's what it feels like, like an arrow. Like an arrow, the Giro is heading north. And I believe we finish in Benevento tomorrow, which is where Daniel warned us about, isn't it? He warned us to keep a close eye on the Maserati there. I'm very nervous about the Maserati in these narrow streets in these very old Italian towns. Oh my towns. goodness, there are a few nervous <laughs> moments, but we can assure the people at Maserati that the car is okay. The car. But there were a few <laughs> nervous moments as we as we inched our way through these very narrow streets. Uh, and the Italians were very helpful, weren't they? Everyone, all these local uh, people just appearing from nowhere to help with uh, the manoeuvres through the streets. Catanzaro must be the, the world three-point turn championship venue because so many of the streets were very 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 tight and everybody had an opinion on how best to get around the tight turns they certainly did and they weren't <laughs> shy in expressing those opinions no. were they the moment was when the single bead of sweat on your brow richard just dropped onto the gear stick and yeah. i thought we might be in trouble here i said turn up the air conditioning please lionel 
<laughs> anyway. Listen, so a reminder, please leave a review on uh, iTunes, if, if you will. You'll find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Twitter. We are cycling underscore podcast and on we're on Facebook and Instagram as well Jonathan Rowe our head of winning behaviors is doing a great job of really keeping the social media stuff going so thank you very much indeed to Jonathan thank you very much to you Lionel thank you to Daniel for the shark's tail uh, that's going to keep coming every day even while he's not on the race for a few days but uh, yeah that's all for us today I'm Richard Moore thank you very much Lionel Burney thank you Rich thank you.